Hey everybody, Suxidu here, and today I am joined by Daniel Meek from Biceps and Banter. Dan, thanks for joining me. Yeah, half of Biceps and Banter, isn't it? You had the other half on the other day. I, I did, yeah, you should have heard what you had to say about you, mate. I'd, um, oh, I I'd be prepared to, to bite back today and get some <laughs> yeah, revenge. Yeah, well, I've seen him play golf, so it's fine. <laughs> um, I've got a video as well, video evidence of it, so I'll just post that. Yeah, so... We will be going through Dan's story, career, and the business um, that he's running today, really successful business, Biceps and Banter, in detail. But in the meantime, Dan, if you just want to give people a quick overview of, of who you are and what Biceps and Banter is. Uh, who am I? That's a question. For now. Uh, just, uh, I'm just an ordinary guy. You know, it's that whole thing, <laughs> isn't it? I'm just an ordinary guy. Um, yeah, so I'm just, uh, I say just a coach, but I've been coaching people... Uh, Forever, basically, since I was an adult, I think I got into coaching of some of some description, which I'm sure we'll get into. Um, yeah, so so I kind of started off with that, and it's kind of evolved as as time has gone on, obviously, just with expertise and how they've changed um, as to who I coach. Um, but yeah, I've always always coach people, um, which yeah, it's funny. I literally from I'm just thinking, I even before I don't know, even when I was 14, 15, I was coaching because um, at that level of, of school, like you had. GCSEs that were done, you know, you had coaching elements within that. Um, it's going to primary school for coaching, which is, um, so I've always, always done it. And then Vice of Banner is now a, a business and a company, which again sounds crazy to say out loud, um, that provides, I suppose, fat loss coaching and now also coaching other coaches um, on how to, I suppose, build, build a business that they may wish to, to build that maybe looks similar to what we've done. Um, and that's kind of where we're at now. Um, I suppose we'll talk about how that's evolved in the last sort of um, yeah, four or five years, I guess, um, what it is today. 100%. So am I right in thinking that you got your start in the industry in professional sport? Or was that step one? Yeah, step one, yeah. So I um, I think it was about the age of 16. Um, so just as I was going into A-levels, I remember that I knew I wanted to do this uh, or go into professional sport as a career because I picked my A-levels based on what I thought people at the university would, would, would want. So I did biology, PE and psychology. And uh, I did IT as an AS level as well. Um, and I sort of went down that route of, I, could, I wasn't good enough to play sport professionally. I realized that at 15, 16, I wasn't good enough. So I was like, right, well, how can I be involved in sport um, and, and still, still kind of be in that arena? And at the time, um, sports science wasn't really, it was just emerging. It was like, you could go to university and study it. Um, and it was at the time where some football teams were starting to talk about it. So those, those people who are, Old enough to know Sam Allardyce at Bolton and all those sorts of things, like and Alex Ferguson was at United at the time, and they were the only two in the Premier League that kind of talked about it, and it was still very much a young thing. Um, and it was an emerging thing, so there was quite a few jobs available within that that arena, and, and it became quite prominent. So it was what I wanted to do. I thought, right, I'll be a sports scientist. I'll go into sports science. And at the time, I didn't really know much about personal training, fitness, or anything like that. It was just for me, it was I was interested in sport. And I was half decent at school, so I was like, right, well, if I do science stuff, then I can apply it to some sport. Um, so I knew quite quickly um, when I was 16. So a lot of choices I made from the age of 16 to 18 uh, and, and further into 21 when I went to uni. And that five-year period, all the choices I made were sort of gearing me towards going into professional sport. So um, at uni, I, you know, I, I gave up a lot of my free time to go and work for free at football clubs. So I didn't turn at football clubs at the time. They were offering out these free sort of placements. So I'd just go and spend every summer, every summer and every Easter, I would spend at a football club um, getting some, some work experience for free. So I, luckily I, I mean, I supported Reading Football Club, which is uh, nothing to shout about. Um, but I just managed to, to I, I just, I did, I did it the old fashioned way, I just sent letters. I just sent letters to the people there and said, can I, can I come and, and work you know, with you guys and I'll do anything. I just want to see what it's like in the sports science department. And at that point, at that time it was, Got, a, got an email back and you got someone go, yeah, okay, cool, come in. Like, why, why, why wouldn't you, I suppose, someone offering for free to do dog body work? And um, yeah, I got my in and, and I went there for, for one summer and then they kept asking back every time I was on uni. They were like, oh, do you want to come back and do some more? Like, we have me around and stuff like that. And that's how I, um, I got my break and all the other, I suppose, kids that are on my degree and on my placement did sports science. I weren't really sure what they wanted to do. I already, already knew. And, and that's where... I think it came to like the last year at, at university and they did like the whole like, oh, so what are you going to do for your placement? You need to do a six-week placement. And I went along and like, I've already done 24 weeks of work at a football club and people couldn't believe it. And I was like, and then I went from uni, did a master's and then got into professional football straight away. And I think people were a bit like, oh, how did you do it? And I was like, well, 
I didn't go on holiday and I didn't do all that shit. I worked on it for free while I lived with my nan. So I was like, that's how I did it. Um, and I think it's still being good set up at this point as well. Um, yeah. Sort of a bit, a bit of graft, I suppose. Yeah. I think a lot of people, like myself included, when I was in A level, like sports science, going to work in professional sport. Um, but I think a lot of people, and, and you could probably um, correct me on this, or you probably have, probably have more uh, a better insight. A lot of people go into it thinking it's one thing, and then quickly realize that it's not as exciting as they think. It's there are fewer jobs. Obviously, you got into it at a time where there were more jobs. It's not very well paid, um, and they don't actually have much say in what can be done. So, how did you how did you find work in professional sport? Um. It was eye-opening for sure. Um, I think for me, it started off with I knew that I was going to wash protein shakers and prepare water bottles and stuff. I kind of knew that was going to be the case. At, 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 again, at an intern level, um, and I suppose what I didn't quite realise was how long it would take for me to be in a position where people would just. Um, and I think it's one of those. Where I was never afraid of hard work, so I, again, I knew it would be a case of of, of that and. and so yeah, in terms of like getting people to to take me seriously, I really I think I realized quite quickly that and I saw other people get absolutely eaten alive because they weren't prepared to almost um, stand up for themselves a little bit, but also have a bit of banter and have a personality. And I think luckily for me, um, having done the work for free in, in football, when I got to the point where I was actually in there on a in a pay position, I quickly realized that to get people's respect, you have to almost join in and. Um, have fun with it, have a bit of banter and, and be able to take it as well as give it a little bit. And it was very much based on your personality. And I quickly realized that you could know everything in the world, you can have all the degrees and all this sort of stuff. But if you did, they didn't like you as a person, you were not going to get anywhere. And yeah. that, that's kind of, that was kind of it pretty much. But for me, is I realized, right, get your head down, clean these shakers, make jokes about the fact that all you do is clean shakers, make the fact about jokes about the fact no one listens to you and pays attention. But then when you have got something to say, stand up and say, well, no, look, this actually needs to be talked about and this needs to be discussed and whatever, because they, they then took it seriously. Whereas if you were someone that was always very much down the line, this is what this is what this says, this is what the training says, and, and you were almost a bit too bookworm-like, they would just destroy you um, in, in football. So um, that, that's kind of what I realized. And, and I think that as I got through it, as I got through into, into my sort of first paid role, like you said, I got no problem talking about how much you know I got paid. I was the first team sports scientist, so a Premier League football club. Um, we got well in the championship at the time. We got promoted that year. Um, I was on twenty two thousand pound a year. Um, I think they knew that they could pay me so so little because I was um, it was my first paid job in, in in the industry. I was still quite surprised at how low it was, but I was like, right, cool. Again, get your head down. You'll be fine. In, in a few years' time, you'll be at the top level with everyone else. Um, and then when you realise how much work you had to do for it, I remember in my first year, I remember sitting down over the summer, um, bearing in mind you have to work Christmas Day, Boxing Day, um, you know, at any point the manager, if, if a player has a bad game, I'm going to never forget, players get beat 4 on Saturday, you've arranged to go drive home to see Mrs. on Sunday, drive back Monday for work, and the team moves 4-0, he's like, you're all training on Sunday morning. You're, you're in training Sunday morning, like a job for a hat on a Saturday at 6pm. Um, Again, Christmas Day, all this sort of stuff, and obviously have a longer break over the summer. But then it came to that summer, and they said, oh, "Okay, cool. So here's the rota for who's in and who's out off over the summer." And I was like, "What?" Well, like, I was injured players, and obviously sports managers to kind of help them. So I think I had like two weeks off over the summer, no holiday during, not the holiday during the season, nothing like that. And I just remember I had to do all the reserve team games, just have to travel away to like, you know, Bradford, Sunderland, like from Hull, which is not not easy on a Wednesday night. Um, when you got training the next day on Thursday, and I remember working on like hourly pay, and it was like four pound twelve p an hour. Um, and I was like, ah, do I really want to want to be doing this? And then went back for the first season in the Premier League. It was, um, and I remember going back in there thinking, okay, cool, I've got a year under my belt. Hopefully, they listen a bit more to me now. I went away on pre-season tour to Portugal, or whatever. Um, and. I'll never forget, like, seeing, the, at the time, I think they hired someone else. They hired another, like, head of S&C who came in. He was, like, a four-year-old guy, so knowledgeable, knew everything, been at Loughborough University, been at Man City's Academy. And for him, this was, like, a step up to go to the first team. And within a week, within a week, the management and the manager's, like, fitness coach mate, who was just no one, basically, just, just a guy with a whistle who shouted, yeah, run more, um, decided within a week that they didn't really like him, didn't really get on with him personality of wasn't matched. I was just sat there and I could see it all unfold in front of me. And I could see like the management team, the manager, his little mate, 
who was in charge of everyone in the sports science department, even though he didn't know anything, because he was only reporting to. So this head of SNC come in. I was the first team sports scientist. So this guy was kind of ahead of me anyway, he'd been head of SNC. And I could just see it a mile away. I was just sat there looking around going, what? I can't do this. He was 40, moved away from his wife and two kids, left Man City's academy where he'd been there for eight years, probably on a, a decent salary at, at that point, lived in near Manchester, was driving backwards and forwards from Hull, staying overnight in a place in Hull. He was 40-odd. And I could just see he got this job within a week, no one respected him. And I was like, I can't do this. I was yeah. like, I can't be 40 and do this. And it was at that moment, I just, I never forget it. I was sat in the sports science office. I was eating breakfast, doing some data analysis. And I remember it because it all happened. And then the very, that very week, we had a meeting in, in the office with the manager. It was pre-season. Um, and we're talking about um, some players and whether they were ready for the season or whatever. I don't remember what it was now. Something like that. Or well, it was like six games in or something like that. We had six games in a row real quick after pre-season. That was it. Six games in a row, really, really quick. And um, we were all in a, in a meeting in the sports science department. And I just said, based on the data, I was like, these players played all pre-season. They've run their socks off. They played these six games back to back. They can do the rest. If you want them to play all season, like they're, they're going to need some time to, to rest, basically. All the training, because again, the manager was like big on running with the ground. So I said to his mate, who was the fitness coach, I was like, this is what this is what I'm seeing. This is the data. Like, do with it what you will, but that's what I think. And he was like, "Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, yeah. Like, if that's what you said. It says then, then propose that, say that, and look, we'll, we'll hopefully we'll, we'll we'll get these guys some rest further." Go into the meeting, and the manager goes, "Ah, oh, so anything from sports science you need to know about?" And um, and Will, who was his fitness coach, to go, Dan, what anything to say? I was like, "Yeah, just just let you know, Gaffer. You know these three players. Like, they played a lot. You know, they're our star players. They're doing really well. Like." At some point, they're going to need a rest because they played three, six games back to back. They played all the, all the three, three preseason games. I was like, probably could give them a break at some point. He then turned to his mate and went, Is that right, Will? And he went, No, nah, they'll be all right. I'll they'll be fine. No problem. Like that. And I remember at that point just going, I'm done. And it was the same week that that had happened with this guy, you know, come in. I was just like, nah. Couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it anymore. And um, I, at the time, I, my dad was. Um, my dad was having a kid, he was, he was on the kidney transplant list, have a kidney transplant. He lived in London, I lived in Hull. And it was just like this weird coincidence that all this stuff happened at once. And then a week after that, pretty much, I had a phone call at six, uh, seven o'clock in the morning. I was in the training room at seven o'clock in the morning. Seven o'clock in the morning from my dad. And my dad would never ring me at six o'clock in the morning, ever. And it was like, yeah, we've had the call, like, and we've had my transplant kind of thing. So I went to the gaffer and I was like, this is what happened. And he said, look, go home, like go and see your dad, whatever, do all that sort of stuff. I went down to see him. And I also at that week had a interview at a gym in London for a job. And I could use the excuse of the fact that I had to go see my dad to almost do this interview. Went into London, had the interview with this gym. And that was it. It was all done in the space of like two weeks. I handed my notice in. And I just that moment, I realized that I just couldn't do it anymore. I just couldn't see the, the politics in the world of football. I was like, I couldn't do it. I decided, I was like, I'm not putting all that work and effort in for the next 18 years to be treated like that guy was, even though he knew loads of stuff and he was really, really good. Just couldn't do it to myself. Um, so I, I kind of used that as a reason to, to move back to London. And then, uh, did any, at this point, are you thinking, I want to run a business or, or anything entrepreneurial, or are you just thinking, I'm going to go and be a personal trainer, fitness coach, work in the gym. Like, what's in your head at that point? At that point, it was, I also had a girlfriend at the time who lived in London. <clears throat> so that was kind of part of it. I think my, my, my initial view was I wanted a bit more autonomy because <clears throat> I realised that in football, again, I was just working whenever someone else told me to work and the hours were ridiculous. And I thought, well, being a PZ in two more hours. Um... But I think I'd also kind of wanted a bit of my, my life back because I felt like I'd given away so much to try and make it in football between the age of, like I said, probably you know, 18 to 23. I hadn't really done any holidays, hadn't been traveling like my friends had been traveling, hadn't really lived a life, hadn't really lived with housemates that I really loved, like, liked to live with other than at uni. And, you know, all those guys went on to London together and lived together again in London. And I think at that point, I just wanted to live in London for a couple of years and just, just see what came with it. Just be a PT in London. I was like, there's money in London. I'll be a PT, see what happens. Um, and yeah, it was just it was just a bit of an adventure more than anything at the time. I think it was just, uh, 20, I think it was 23, 23, 24. 
Um, and I just decided, see what happens. It was never, it was never, a, oh, I'll go work for myself and be this, you know, be this business or anything like that because the, the gym I went to was Third Space. And at the time at Third Space, one of the reasons I chose them was because you were actually employed. So you had a very small, oh, it was small to be fair, base salary, but then you took a percentage cut of your clients and you effectively got given your clients on the gym floor. It wasn't like a rent model when I had to go and canvas for my clients. Like you, you stayed there long enough, you would get given leads, you know, not, 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 not shitloads, but you would regularly kind of get people sent away by email to go, this so-and-so just joined the gym, they've got five free class sessions, you know, reach out to them and say, what PT? Um, so yeah, it was, it was, we rocked up, um, and me and Tom Hall started in the same week. Um, and me and Tom still do a podcast together now, and we rocked up on the first week, and it was weird because we both, he'd done exactly the same thing, only with a different football club, and he was in performance analysis, and he had exactly the same experience. And we both came together with that first week, we were chatting about, obviously, what we experienced in football. Um, and yeah, we, we kind of were a bit competitive, and I'll never forget, we sat down with the, with the manager at the time, who was a really good guy, he sat down and, um, and he just said, look, guys, he said, with your knowledge level, with where you come from, and you've got the opportunity here to, to smash this. Like, you could be the top performing trainers um, if you do this the right way. Uh, and he said, you know, the most anyone's ever done in, the first, um, in their first month of, as a PT here is 50 sessions. So I'd expect you guys to be somewhere close to, to doing 50 sessions within a month. And we were like, we both looked at each other, obviously, like competitive from football. We are like, come on, then, let's see what we can do kind of thing. Um, you won. So it's weird how, again, from that, like, uh, I think I won. I think it was 60, <laughs> I got 60, 65, maybe I think he got 62, or something like that. I wouldn't know the exact numbers <laughs> off the top of my head, but it was close. But we both would have won it if it was not for the other one being there kind of thing anyway. Um, yeah, and, and it's funny how we took the same principles from what we'd done in football to get to get to that point, which was work work on themselves, be there, be be person, um, be personal with people, be sociable, you know, be a decent person. We applied the same things and, and it paid off in, in one to one PT. You know, we just spent every hour there. So like when you first start, most PTs when they go start a gym like that is they do their shifts, they get given their leads by email, they email them, they'll come in, they'll do them and go home. And they kind of you know they kind of bask in the free time a little bit. Um, whereas we were there like, well, we might as well just stay all day, we've got nothing else to do, we might as well see speak to people and be, be near the sales office. Like, so again, there was a sales desk where the guy who was shaking around the gym, he'd upsell them into their, their gym membership. And then he'd be like, oh, you get fly free personal training sessions. And then me and Tom were literally sat on the sofa while he was saying that to them. And they, and they would be like, oh yeah, that sounds really good. Can we get booked in tomorrow? And he'd literally turn and go, Dan, Tom, you got any time tomorrow? And people couldn't figure it out that we were getting all these people and, and how. And I was like, well, we're just not stupid. Like you're going home. And we're just sat right here and, and we can speak to these people. We see them. And we go, oh, so what, you know, what, what are you interested in? Oh, I want to lose fat, I want to gain muscle, I want to do this. And it was just, I, I found it quite, I don't want to say easy, but to us it seemed straightforward at least. Maybe it wasn't that easy, but straightforward. It's be, be a person, be human, show, show you that you've got a sense of humour and that you're a decent person to spend time with and it'll probably be all right. Um, and yes, yeah, so that's kind of how, how it started. And, and I said, even at that point, we never really had any other views other than wanting to be full at that point or whatever we deemed to be full um, at that point. Um, and yeah, I suppose the other thing as well, I've left out is at this point I was doing some online coaching on the side. So I was doing bits of, of online coaching, um, but never anything like, never you know, huge amounts of clients. I think the most I probably had at that point would be eight or nine or something like that, charging, probably charging six to three months or something at that point, you know, the, the high life of the beginning. Um, so that was for me is again I, I wanted a certain number of clients because I also had the online stuff that was that was again I worked with another company so it was a case of I didn't have to do loads and loads of work I just had to kind of do the other social media uh, and then they would again send people your way because they'd ask for you on a website or you know they'd say they weren't didn't have a preference and you just get you the leads that way so for me there wasn't really much of a business it was just a case of I just gave away a percentage of whatever I earned to someone else to find leads for me yeah. So when did the transition to fully online happen? Was that next? Was that after Third Space, or or was it? Was there anything else? Before? Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was after Third Space. So I've been at Third Space for a while. Um, not quite how long? Two years, maybe. 
wasn't too long, but again, I got full pretty quick. So again, first month I, I got to 60, 50, 60. Um, and I only ever wanted to do 80, 80, 90 a month because of the way I wanted my, my sort of schedule to be structured. And, and I was lucky that quite quickly got full uh, and then managed to kind of manipulate my timetable as I wanted it to be. So I'd only worked, I'd worked pretty much most mornings and only two evenings was my thing. I didn't want to stay in the evening. I wanted to, to do most of my stuff in the morning. So I did that and um, I got lucky enough to work with a very, um, a very exclusive client while I was there and did a bit, bit, bit and bit to train with them um and then it was when laura it was when laura fell pregnant so when she fell pregnant we kind of like looked at it and we were like do we want to bring up bring up isabel in london we were just a bit like oh, i'm not really sure if it's what we want to do um and at the time i joined um i was part of team box with mike um steve chris laura and and again we were um and are in about kind of like okay if we were to really go for this and kind of make it bigger as big as we think it could be we probably need to spend more time together so it all just kind of came together really at the time we were like look let's just let's just take a leap and go right we're going to make this happen make this online coaching thing a, a real business I think at the time i might have had 15 15 to 20 clients maybe online um which was nowhere near enough to to support a family in, in bath or whatever um but it was one of those standard things that you get into as a as a, as a coach which is I'm doing a bit of a bit of in person, a bit of online. You're kind of happy with both, but one on their own wouldn't be enough to do what you wanted to do. Um, so I did the ballsy thing and just went right. Well, yeah, I just 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 move. And me and Laura decided to just um, to just make the the trip. And because luckily, because we're in a gym where you're employed, Laura had some maternity pay for six months at least. Not a lot, but at least she had something. Um, which you wouldn't get, most PTs wouldn't get, of course, if they're, if they're PT. So Laura's a PT as well, sorry for, for added context. Um, yeah, we just decided to um, make the leap, which I'd done up to this point. I, I said this to, to Mike on a, on a YouTube video we did not long ago. I said every time I've done that, it's, it's kind of paid off. So I was like, screw it, just do it. Um, yeah. You know, I took the leap to go into football up, up in Hull, and I took the leap to move down to London. And it was just a case of, well, screw it, let's just do it again, back yourself and, and go for it. Yeah, I think th there's two ways to look at that. I'm the same. Like if I if I if I decide I'm going to go for something, it's a, a leap of faith, no parachute. You know, figure it out and mm. you know, jump off the cliff, figure out the parachute on the way down. Um, but it's not for everyone, and I think a lot of people kind of make that leap of faith without without having that experience of yeah, I know I'll figure it out because I've done X Y Z before, um, or I've put the work in prior to it. Um, so you've You've taken this leap of faith. You've joined Teambox, which is effectively like an online coaching company, mm -hmm. uh, as a member of the team. Um, and that doesn't quite work out long term. So obviously, without going into too much detail, Mike has gone into a bit of detail on that as well. For those of you listening, if you want to listen to Mike's podcasts, um, you go into a bit more detail. But that doesn't really work out. Um, so you just want to speak on that briefly, and then and then how you know biceps and banter kind of grew from that. Yeah, so it, it, it kind of came about because it was effectively um, five people who all had a differing way of what maybe direction we should take. And ultimately, it became two sides that were just butting heads the whole time, me and Mike, and then the other two. I say two, I mean, like, the other, then we had a, a female called Laura, um, who went her own way as well in the end. So you could obviously say it's three kind of sides to it, but... Just regularly butting heads on what we should and shouldn't do. And we just felt like there was a lot of time wasted, personality clashes, what should and shouldn't be done. And me and Mike just spent a lot of time together through that. And and, and because of the, 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 the clashes and what should and shouldn't be, it was like, you know, things like what should we put out on social media, what should be done for launches, and all this sort of thing. Um, the, the main guy, Steve, didn't want his, his name associated too much to maybe some of the stuff you're saying or talking about, which... I guess his prerogative, I suppose, to a certain degree, but it then became very clear that it was his thing, not it was supposed to be like a joint thing, we we're all in it together. And then it quickly became apparent, and maybe Mike's going to this in more detail, that it wasn't. It was kind of like, well, I don't want my name associated with that stuff. In fact, I don't know, I thought this was a group thing. So that was kind of where Bison and Banner started as a YouTube channel. Um, we were like, okay, cool, okay, we're going to put your name, we'll put it separately, we'll just put out some, some fun videos and do what we want to do. Um, 
so yeah, that, that's kind of how the, the channel came about. And then it just became apparent that as we started doing more and more of them, that it, like I said, it was just we were growing apart in terms of what we believed and what we thought the best way of going about things was. Um, and uh, yeah, I suppose another leap of faith was taken where it was like uh, something happened. There was kind of a big, a big thing that happened. Um, it was funny enough when I was away training my client, my sort of quite exclusive client that I trained at the time, I was away training him for a couple of weeks in Paris. And um, Mike was away on holiday at the time, I think, as well. And something had been done behind our back that we'd all planned, been changed to suit the other person's um, way of doing things. And we were just like, no, I'm done. We're just done. We're like, when we get back, we're 10 of them done and we're going our own way. So we decided to, to again take another leap of faith and do that. And I remember we were a bit nervous at the time, but less nervous this time because we were like, no, we genuinely believe that this is the right way of doing things. Grow and we'll be bigger. And um, there's this false sense of security, I think, sometimes as a group. Um, even if things aren't going well, you kind of assume, well, it's the like, shared responsibility thing of, well, if, if I do badly, everyone else is badly, so it's not as bad, which is ridiculous when you think about it. But um, it was a bit of that. So we just decided to. Um, to run with the YouTube channel and, and kind of go all in on it, really. Um, and felt as if we'd be able to do everything our way and how we wanted to do it. Um, and safe to say it's uh, worked out all right, I think. So, yeah, it's um, yeah, definitely. started off with like, so just a YouTube channel and it's and it's and, it, and it's now much more than that. But, but again, the same, I think the same message is still there. I think throughout our, our time of working together, I think the same. One thing that we've never wavered on is our message, even in putting across. Right or wrongly, but again, it's, it's led to us doing the game in terms of business. So we kind of again felt a bit vindicated in our decision to go right with our own thing. I think the other two guys um, uh, not not kind of doing as well, maybe. So it, it kind of feels a little bit like, well, at least we've grown and gone to do everything our own way and it's kind of worked out for, for the best for us. So that's kind of the way we look at it now. Yeah. So Biceps and Banter today is one-to-one -one online coaching you have your clients mike has his you have a team of coaches mm -hmm. um a group program and obviously a business education mentoring element to it as well um what i want to kind of ask you about is you know having a, a team of co-founders effective effectively didn't really work or business partners didn't really work at team box but it has obviously for you and mike at um biceps and banter why do you think that is like what's important from from a you know people who are interested in finding a partner for example so just to give this a bit of context you know we've you know kind of got into the world of silicon valley and investors and, and all that stuff with stridus and what we found is most investors won't even give you the time of day if you don't have a co-founder if you don't have business partners if you don't have a, a team of co-founders um so it's super common Right, most big businesses will have two or three people who found the company, but in fitness, it's just I won't say unheard of, but super uncommon. Um, so, uh, going back to the question, why didn't it work at Team Bots compared to why it has worked at Biceps and Banter? And do you think more people should consider partnerships? Uh, good, good question. I think. Um... I think it didn't work with Teambox because it was too many. It was five people who were um, who were thrown together and told, I suppose, that you're all a part of this, you're an equal part of it. Um, and there's a lot of different voices, a lot of different ways of doing things. And I think it would have been different had it been that we were like co-founders and we had people working underneath us doing the bulk of the work. But the problem was that we were all at such a small level of a, of a I don't want to call it a start, but that level is just five people working together is that our own individual income was dictated by our clients. And then there was kind of like this overarching brand, which kind of like dictated how well that did, even though it was down to us as individuals to get our own clients, as it were. So it kind of felt a little bit like, well, we've been hamstrung by a big brand message, but we can't do things that we know would work to get one-to-one -one clients, which kind of was a bit a bit annoying from, from that point of view. Um, and I think as well, like just to be honest, I just don't think, I don't think the chemistry was right between all the people that were there. I think it was... That, that was, that's what it comes down to. I don't think it was a case of there was anything amazing wrong. Probably a bit naive in business sense as well. We just hadn't really run businesses at that point. We were just we were just all online coaches or PTs previously and been thrown together in our first kind of thing together. Um, so I wonder how many of those people, like say in Silicon Valley stuff and the co-founders, strike you know strike lucky with the first thing they do together or first thing they ever do. I'd imagine there's a bit of 
these are the few failed things first to realize well i don't like working with that type of person or i do like working with that type of person and i think for me and mike the reason that we sort of branched off together was that our values were just pretty much the same um we spent a lot of time together not only in a work sense but also personally like our sense of humor is the same we got on like the same things on tv and all that sort of stuff so it was very much a case of our values were aligned from from that point of view um and we get on outside of work like we would if we were just to go for, for a drink or food or, or, or watch some sport it would, we'd have similar views and similar ways of doing things but for us the biggest thing is our sense of humor is, is the thing that, that, that kind of binds us as it were um which i think is saying most most friends i suppose i think we probably get on mainly because you find them fun to be around or you, you know you find the same things funny um and, and it kind of bled into our fitness content i suppose to a certain degree as well and i think the key thing with, with having someone in a partnership is that you have the same values which i think is, is key but then also that you have different strengths so we have the same values we know what we want out of our business but we have different strengths within it so mike is a little bit more creative and probably a little bit more um comes up with more ideas comes up with more of the strategy maybe for like what would be good in the future where we can go with things and i'm more of the person that actually turns that into reality of what does that look like from a logical standpoint and how we can make that work um rather than i think if you have a, both of you that are just super super crazy with ideas at some point you're going to clash and you're going to go well mine is better and mine is better whereas we just both know our role and we go well mike's more than someone that's going to drive those forward thinking ideas and i go right well yeah but how's that actually going to physically work like how are you going to create that launch sequence or that email sequence to make it something viable and they'll go oh yeah we can't or whatever and, and it's just having different strengths i think um that you, you kind of fill the gaps for each person so where i'm a little bit less on the creative side he he fills that gap where, whereas when i'm more technical with good better with cameras and editing and computers it fills all those gaps there um which which i think has probably been our main our main strength um as a, as a partnership is that we we have different strengths but we know the end goal and the values that we've got is the same um and that's why i suggest you would look for if they're looking for someone in, in a partner is it has to be you have to agree on the same values like you for me you couldn't have someone who's like a, a bro bodybuilder loves meal plan work with someone who's flexible dieter and like think he's right and reason he's like you want to be heavy because at some point those values are going to mismatch whether it's to do with hard work whether it's to do with your work ethic like i said whether it's to do with just knowledge gaps in terms of like i believe that you don't need to be this smart to be this coach or you i believe it should be this simple or whatever it is um I think that would be there would be some butting of heads at some point there. So I think it's, it's the value of what you believe the industry should look like should be like that's the matchup. Um and then the, the sort of the I suppose the knowledge gaps then can be filled in in terms of the tech or in terms of the actual like say business um creativity, whatever that kind of side of things. I don't know if that's what you found in your stuff as well, but um for us that's what we found. Yeah, definitely I think that this yeah, I think you've nailed it. The, the most important things are the shared values. Um, I think being aligned on what the goal is and the mission is, and, and and that can obviously help. And I think obviously that changes often, but having a kind of, this is kind of where we think we're heading. And, and as long as that's the same, that's great. And then ideally some complementary skills or um, and not just both the same. Um, yeah, I think, I think that is important. One of the... One of the things that you've done, which I think is becoming more common as well, is you've built a team. So you've got a team of coaches. So it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on how you found that, pros and cons. Uh, let's start there. So how you found it and, and kind of the good, the bad, the ugly. Yeah, I mean, this started when we worked, started when we were working with you, really, I suppose, in terms of when we developed um, you know, our group coaching program with you. Um, you basically told us to stop sitting on our hands and just get out there in the world. Um, and, and then hiring, you know, again, that's kind of, I suppose, the main thing you helped us with. Had, you, you'd done that before, we hadn't. And I just feel like, I don't want to say mistakes with it, because that makes it sound bad as if we picked the wrong people. That's not, that's not the case. People that we've worked with have been great and we picked them for a reason and all that sort of stuff. I just think you quickly realize when you bring on, you bring on coaches that you need a completely different set of skills to manage those people. Um, and I think it's something we probably weren't ready for. I think that there's an assumption where, again, we talk about this quite a lot, there's this assumption that people who work with you can, can read your mind 
and like that they have the same shared values and they know exactly how you would do something or they know exactly how it should be done. And if you're someone who runs a business or owns a business and you do things at a higher level than what you perceive to be a higher level than other people and, and that sort of stuff, you have to understand that not everyone sees the world that way. Not everyone will put that same level of, level of effort in, you know, just naturally. Um, they will see it as in they're going to clock in and clock out because it's their job, not their whole life. Whereas for us, it can, I suppose, you know, blur the lines between work and life a little bit with, with being, you know, having your own business, being an entrepreneur, whatever you want to call it. Um, so I feel like for us, it was very much a case of we were poor managers and poor communicators um, of, of those coaches. Um, but that's the main, the main thing I would say that is, that is a weakness and something that we still work on today and that we have to work on consistently. You can't assume that people know exactly what you mean or what you want. Uh, you have to, again, as you told us the first time we did this, you have to write things down and have things written down that this is how things are done. That's the, that's the protocol, follow it. Any questions, let me know, but that's the protocol. And it's those sorts of things um, that I think you, you come into, you, you just come up against problems with that, I think. Um, and no one prepared you for that. I don't think you can be prepared for it. I think managing people is, is quite a unique thing. I think the only way you're going to learn how to do it is exactly the same way that anyone learns how to do any skill, which is just by doing it and messing up and, and going, right, well, we failed there, so we'll be better next time at doing that. Uh, um, and I think we still mess up now. I still don't think we're great communicators. I just still don't think we're great managers. Um, we're getting better, but we are still very limited in, in terms of experience levels. Um, so we can't expect to be amazing. But I do think for us, we got, again, it's that whole thing of as a business owner, it's getting sucked into delivery and then management. And at some point, you can't remove yourself from delivery instantly. You have to have this. This period of time where you kind of slowly remove yourself from the delivery and then you can start to manage people to do the jobs effectively and then you start seeing people doing the delivery and they don't do it as well as you and you're like oh i'll just i'll just do it myself and that's like the worst thing you can do because then they don't learn and then you get something to do in the work anyway um and, and that i again i don't know but I, I think for us that process will take a lot longer than than it will for most people um because we're like we're still in the delivery element of it um you know, it's, it's going to take time. And I think when you work in a personal business like online coaching is, it's not as easy to remove yourself um, as it may be kind of product-based thing. Kind of product-based, you know, business, you could probably train someone up and go, this is how you do it, you press this button, you do this, and it's a little bit easier. Whereas with what we do, it's just so customer-facing. Um, you can't just hand all your clients up to someone else and go, right, we'll make the same amount of money and then we'll go and do this other thing elsewhere. It doesn't quite work like that. It's, there's a very much uh, a longer transition period. Um, which we struggled with initially, I think, as well, uh, and still struggle with now, um, is, is how we can get more time back to, to manage people effectively so the business can, can kind of run. Because I think if you look at our business now, look at the revenue numbers, you might be like, oh, you could sell it for a decent amount of money if it was anything other than a service-based thing. But the problem is we're still very much involved in delivery, so it's not worth X amount of money, even though revenue might look great. It's not worth that much money. You couldn't just sell it, whereas I imagine if like, say, a business like yours, if it gets to a certain level, you can sell it because you're not. It doesn't matter if I own it or someone else owns it, whereas for our business, it does matter if we own it. Um, yeah. so I think that's probably the, the thing that I would say that's quite tough when it comes to, to hiring coaches is, is that, you know, it's very hands-on. Um, and you have to be very, very good at managing them and get them up to, up to speed in terms of you know, what you expect for, for delivery. Uh, and it just takes longer than I think some people are expected to. There are two sides to this though, right? So if this is going to be become more common, there's going to be more coaches doing well and looking to hire. There's obviously going to be more opportunities for coaches who will probably do well working for other coaches. Um, and it's probably, well, it is, it's a, it's a new role. It hasn't been around for longer than a few years where an online coach can come in and, and be a part of a team. Um, what advice would you give to a coach to help them be a great uh, member of somebody else's coaching team add value to the business um, how could they you know, just, just do a great job and, and add, like I said add value to the business I think again making that person's making that person's life easier that you work with I don't want to say work for because I don't think you ever work in this kind of industry I think you work for them there's definitely working with them element to it is I would assume again, like that they're like us, and that they're not—they're going to be the best managers, the best people at managing you. If, if again, it's a fairly new role, new thing, and and I would say take the 
take the initiative to ask that person what you expect, what was expected of you. Say, what do you want me to do on a daily basis, weekly basis? What do you think would be good to do? What, what, are, what are my expectations in terms of lead generation, doing my own stuff? And what are you going to do for me that I don't have to worry about? I think that's the key, the key thing is being very, very clear on, on what you provide and what you give. So given, to give an insight into that, it, uh, what we do, we don't um, provide sort of direct lead generation as in you're going to get X number of leads through every single week and you're going to email them and you're going to send them. That's not what, what we provide. What we offer is a group coaching program that runs uh, pretty successfully, has over 100 people in it per intake. We do five to six intakes a year. And there's an opportunity to upsell those people into coaching. But you still have to post your own content. You still have to make sure that you're present on social media. You still have to be yourself. And what we provide is, well, you don't have to worry about any email marketing. You don't have to worry about any launches of any of those products. You don't have to worry about any admin from that side of stuff. You just have to turn up on social media every day, be yourself. Um, you're still going to get organic leads in as we do normally. But under our brand, you, you have that, I suppose, elevated status of being part of the brand. A bit of exposure to, to a certain degree um, as being part of that brand, but it's, it's more a case of, well, you get to have a group coaching program that you couldn't run on your own because you don't have the infrastructure. Um, and likewise, you don't have the money to pay for ads, maybe, you know, um, marketing and copywriting, email launches, all that sort of stuff. Um, so it's just about being very clear on what you provide, because I think some people have this assumption if they were to join an online coaching company, they would just get given all their leads. And some of them do get given all their leads. And I would say that is you expect a much higher percentage to be taken off that and given, you know, given to the company. So I think for us, what we provide is a lot fairer in terms of percentage that we would take as a company um, because of what we expect that person maybe is a little bit higher than what others expect. Because I've seen some coaches join coaching companies who I know of, and they just don't post on social media. They just don't, they just never turn up on social media. And I'm like, well, that's a pretty cool gig for that coach. But again, expect to not make huge amounts of money per client that you would do if you were working with us because we still want to have a presence on social media and all that sort of stuff. So straight away it would be ask that company what you expect, what's expected of you on a daily basis and what you know they don't have what you don't have to worry about effectively. And I think that would be a good place to start because then you know from day one, right, I start to post on social media or I start to do this, I start to turn up to do this, or I don't have to do that, whichever way. Um, I think that would be the, the main thing, um, I would say. Cool. Okay. So Biceps and Banter, successful one-to-one online coaching business for yourself, for Mike, a team of coaches with one-to-one online, coach, uh, online clients, and a successful group program. So why have you moved towards business mentoring and business coaching, business education? Um, mainly because... We, at the time, were coaching a lot of personal trainers. So probably, well, I would say, a third, third of my clients, I think maybe, maybe in my client, a little bit more, let's say about a third of my clients were, were personal trainers. And we just regularly get asked, well, what would you do here? What would you do here? Like, have you got any advice on this, any advice on that? Um, and then we were kind of like looking around at some of the advice that we'd seen, you know, being given by other people. Um, other mentors and other, other people in our space that we, we'd known of and heard of and all that sort of stuff. Um, and we're just like looking around and being like, hang on a minute, we've got a pretty successful business here. We haven't done anything that they're talking about. Like anything. Like they were talking about some really, really you know, weird stuff. Um, so we're just kind of like, is this advice even right? Like we're not sure. And obviously like we work with you and we got to a position where again, we knew it was, there was never any sort of like, crazy tactics. It was more a case of like, well, does that align with what you want out of your life and your business? Is that going to work for you? What's the end goal? Like, it was all very much a case of like, you listen to us first and then we talk about what the outcome might be. And it seemed as though everyone else was just handing out the same blueprint to people and going, well, do this and you'll get clients. And we would just see some of the content that was going out and some of the things that our clients were being told to do by the mentors. And we were just like, why would you do that? Like, that seems bonkers. And we'd get clients say to us, well, I've been told to do this, but I noticed you guys never do it. You guys do all right. We're like, yeah, we do all right. We haven't done that. And it just, it, it just, it just came about because we were like, okay, what is the next evolution of what we're doing? Are we just going to coach people one to one, fat loss forever? No, we weren't going to do that. So then we were like, okay, cool. So what's the next logical step? Well, we're getting these questions. We're getting people asking these questions. We're already training with the PTs. Is there a market for us to go into this area? And we were a bit nervous about it because I don't think it's a particularly well-respected area um, of, of the industry. I think it's full of, full of people who are out to, to make a quick buck. Um, 
and, I, and I'll be honest, I don't think any of them know as much as maybe there might be, it looks like they know and all that sort of stuff. I think a lot of it's regurgitated and things like that. Um, and, it, and it came back down to when we started doing one-to-one -one coaching, we were always like, there's people out there selling meal plans, selling chicken, broccoli and rice. You know, Mike had fallen for that when he was a bodybuilder. I'd done it to a certain degree when I was at uni. Um, and we used to remember saying to people, well, if we don't fight against it, we're part of the problem. If we don't highlight this is wrong and that there's other ways of doing it and a better way of doing it, we're kind of part of the problem. And we kind of applied the same logic then to the to the business. I like to call it a coach and I hate the word mentoring. Um, I know that's what we're going to get called. I just, I just think it's such a negative connotation. But we were like, well, let's see if we can coach coaches and how to do what we've done and how we got where we are. And we can start putting some content out and see if people like it and see if people think there's a, you know, that we can help them. And that's, that's literally how it evolved was we have enough people that follow us for long enough um, that were like, yeah, we want your help. And I've not been doing it long, um, maybe what, six, seven months in already. And I'd say 50% of our clients each now are, are coaches that are asking for, for business help. And I, I still feel a little bit of an imposter syndrome with it, but I also feel that that's a good sign. I think I've always felt that in any job, new job or new role that I've taken on. I felt that in football, I felt that on the PT. I remember being nervous as anything in my first PT session, even though I've trained professional footballers for you know doing sessions outside, I still felt nervous in this one to one PT session. And I think it's always a good sign. So I was like, well, let's just embrace it um, because we know we're doing the right thing. We know we're ethical. We know we've got the right people's, you know, people's interests at heart. We'll do it our way, we'll do it differently. Um, and, and the feedback so far has been on our content and our stuff like, yeah, you guys just do it differently. Everyone else is saying this, this stuff, but you're saying the opposite and you've been successful. We've got clients that have been successful doing the same thing. And it's kind of, yeah, how we've always got about things really, which is to do things a little bit differently um, and show people that, again, it's, there's no blueprint. It's a case of, yeah, there's principles you could do with following, but I don't like seeing everyone being put through the same the, just the same thing, everyone, and it's like, well, if you don't succeed, it's you're you're the problem. It's like, well, no, it's just that the blueprint wasn't right for you. So we were kind of like taking a different approach to it, um, which again isn't isn't as sexy, isn't as isn't as big on the money side of things, but it is a case of you know, well, you know, if you put the work in and you work hard enough in a year's time, you could be in a position where you've got a full time salary as an online coach. Um, and I think that the thing that we hate about the industry is just how it so becomes so money orientated and so driven on. On, on being successful based on how much money you make per month and you know you see some of the figures thrown around and you know I don't know the, I don't know the quick maths on it but you know if, you, if you've got 20 clients no if you've got 30 clients paying you £150 a month is that four and a half grand a month? I think it's four and a half grand a month um, that's, a, yeah. that's, a, that's, that's a ridiculous wage for most people that's, that's, a, that's a really good amount of money you know you're talking some high level people you know high level jobs getting paid that amount of money and for some reason, for my coach, that's not good enough. Like, that's not okay. Like, that, that, you've only got 30 clients paying 150 pounds. And to me, it just seems mental. Like, I was starting professional football on 22 grand a year. And I know for a fact that there's people at that level now being paid less than four and a half grand a month, but they are higher than I was at that time, they're in their 30s. And it just seems a massive disconnect. So, it's that kind of for us is, is why we want to go into this and show people look, if you work hard and get 30 clients in a year's time, that is an amazing result. But the way it's thrown around at the moment is, well, you should be able to get that in 30 days. It's like mental. Like, no, like you'll do very well to do that in 12 months. But, you know, even if it took two years, why is that a problem if it takes two years? Why is it a problem? Like you might actually figure out more by it taking two years because you'll know what works, what doesn't work. Um, so, yeah, it was kind of for us, it was, it was a natural progression. To, I suppose to channel our passion for the industry um in a way we can help people again stop being screwed over stop being ripped off um and, and kind of bring a bit of realism i think to to the to the space because it doesn't seem to be a lot of it it seems to be all very pie in the sky and you know crazy crazy numbers and crazy things we were talking about and we were like well actually the the as with most things the fitness is not black and white there's there's shades of gray in there and, and that's kind of for us is where we, we spend a lot of our time um yeah i suppose posting content and talking about amazing and is that what the future holds for biceps and banter? So what, what's the plans for the next five years, three, five um, years? What, 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 where's this heading? Honestly, we, we don't have, we don't have any huge, huge plans, um, which sounds pretty bad. I think we probably should have a plan in place. But I think when we look back and realize that we've only been doing biceps and banter for four years, 
it kind of makes us realize, is it four or five years? Maybe it's five, four or five. It kind of makes us realize there's no point making plans for five years because we would never in our wildest dreams of human be here. Um, never. Like, if you just said to me five years ago, you know, be living in Dubai with my new family's business that's doing this amount, I'd be like, I just thought you were mental. Uh, mainly because I barely knew Mike at that point. But, um, but yeah, so, so it, it's kind of hard for us to, to kind of answer that, I suppose, when you kind of think about it. But for us at the moment, it, it, again, it's going down this route and it's, and it's really helping helping these guys get to where they want to be. And I'm kind of sure at some point we'll, we'll be full with those type of clients and we'll get to a point where we can't take on more people because, again, we're not that way inclined where we're going to water down our service so much. So we all get full and there will come a point where we have to think about what we're doing and whether that is that we coach some of our other coaches up to this level where they can provide this level of help um, and we can take a bit more of a backseat on some delivery, potentially. Um, but I, 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 like I said, I think that's probably the, the main thing. For us, we've always kind of just looked at the next goal, the next step, and then from there, we then go, right, what's the next thing we're going to focus on? So for us, it will be get full with, with our sort of coaching clients um, from, a, from a sort of, I suppose, a business coaching point of view um, and then see where, where we need to go and where the gaps are. You know, I suppose uh, are there in the market potentially um, at that point because it's such a fast changing thing that's the thing with fitness and, and all that sort of stuff um, it, it's forever changing but I'm sure there'll be um, there'll be something on the horizon which will be uh, to be new and unique and all that sort of stuff but I think we've worked so hard to get to where we are now there is definitely an element of wanting to enjoy a little bit of the fact that we can take a bit more time to ourselves potentially um, I think we've worked long enough to maybe sort of enjoy a little bit more of the of the life and the whole work life balance. Um, if not for if not for you know just for, for a short period of time uh, before we really kick on maybe. But um, who knows? I'm sure there'll be something there'll be something that will take our eye in, in the in the near future. But I think when we consider what we have achieved, what I've achieved in the years since we've been out here, we looked at the other day and we're just like you just forget. You just don't you just take it for granted. You're always looking ahead, you're looking at the future, you want more, you want this, you want that. I think when you look back, sometimes you realise, you know, in COVID, I remember when we messaged each other in COVID, we thought, we thought COVID could have been it. We were like, that could, that could have done, as it did, so many businesses in, we were just like, well, people aren't going to spend money on this now because they're just not going to have money. And COVID was actually exploded our business and actually made it bigger because of the online stuff. But we didn't know. I think at any moment you feel like it could be taken away from you. So you kind of always have that fear and, and, and worry and concern with that. So it's... Um, yeah, who knows? Who knows? For now, just uh, play plenty of golf. That's the main thing. That's what I care about. Just, uh, play golf. Yeah. Let that unhealthy scarcity uh, drive the business forward. It's fine. That's it. Exactly that. Exactly that feeling that it could all just disappear tomorrow. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. that's really nice. Embrace it. Yeah. Embrace that fear. Yeah. Um, cool. Okay. Are you up for some quick fire questions to finish? Oh, go on then. Why did you move to Dubai? Why did we move to Dubai? Uh, I'd be lying if I didn't say tax was a huge reason. Um, Mike was here, that was another reason, uh, and golf was another reason. Um, but yeah, it was very much a multitude of things. Um, I think, though, as, as you know from me out here as well, I think that kids' education was always a huge part of it. Safety was a huge part, part of it. The weather was a huge part of it. Um, all those things combined, I think, just led to um, taking a leap again, taking another leap, and again, it was backing myself a little bit. Fuck it, take the lead. What's the worst that could happen to me back home again? That was it. What's something you hate about the industry? Um, how easy people make it look. Well, they how much then they say how easy it is. That's the thing that frustrates me most. Because I know that they've worked their nuts off to get where they are. It annoys me. Yeah. What's the biggest mistake you see other coaches making? Copying other coaches. Don't get it. I do. It's this, there's this copy of the coaches who you think are successful but don't actually know if it's working for them or not. That's the thing I find odd. Um, just because someone's got a big following, I'll copy their content because they've got a big following. But yeah, as we both know, we know people with big followings are making hard anyway. Um, yeah, drives me insane that. And to finish on a positive note, what's something you love about the industry? Uh, how much you can influence someone's life. Um, in a positive way. So, so even from a fat loss point of view, obviously now we do, you know, coaching coaches point of view is knowing that if you're prepared to put some work in, I say some work, a lot of work in, you can drastically change your life. Um, I think is, is a huge one. Like people who who like who I've coached with fat loss who have gone on to completely change their health, um, 
get their cycle back, have kids, you know, it's, it's, that's ridiculous to think that you can have an impact on that. And obviously in terms of business stuff, again, some of the people we work with, being in a position where they don't have to fret about certain things like that um, and having that positive influence is, is good. But like I said, the caveat to that is the fact that it's the, the hard work involved um, first, knowing that seeing people get that, get that reward um, from, from that hard work, I think is, is definitely a thing I love about it. Amazing. Last two answers were very similar to, to Mike, people not being themselves and then being able to impact people's lives. In fact, the same answers, which is good to see. Yeah, Those shared values. Scary. Yeah, yeah, shared values and all that. But, um, but yeah, no, it's, uh, it, it, I, I think it's one of those industries where I think look, you've been, probably been through the same thing. Is like you, you have some weeks where you love it and some weeks where you hate it. Because one of those two things just gets on your nerves or, or really lights you up, um, depending on which week you're in. And we all have it. We all have those, those ups and downs, I think, as, as well. I think people listen to this, like, so you, the whole thing about the scarcity stuff that you mentioned there that, that drives you. It's, you know, some weeks you feel like on top of the world, you feel like nothing can touch you and everything's going rosy. You're dreaming about, you know, doubling your income next year and being fantastic. And then the next minute you're worried that all your clients might leave you and you haven't made money. And, you know, it's just like, it's, that's normal. I think you need the, the more you have it, just the reality. Yeah. Yeah. Just the reality yeah. of running the business. Cool. Yeah. And that's, that's the other thing I think as well about, you mentioned before, I just finished on this about coaches and kind of like whether they're right to be working with someone else or not. I think that's, that, that feeling is, is something, if you can ride that feeling out, you're probably fine to be, you know, run your own business. If you feel that really cripples you, probably best having someone who, who you can work with and, and lean on a little bit. Um, I think that's the, the key thing for, so if you in mind, I feel like you've got that accountability of someone else to kind of talk it out with. As on your own, I think it can be um, it can be quite debilitating if you don't have a good support network around you. Um, it's talk through things like that because it's um, it's common, like I say, it's just week to week, isn't it? It's up and down like that. Yeah, especially if things aren't going well. It, it's it's easier to ride if things are going well, but if you're struggling and you're on that roller coaster, then you know it's a different ball game. Right, Dan, uh, it's been a pleasure, mate. If people want to find you, where should they go? Uh, Instagram at Dan Biceps Banter, and then if you go on YouTube, you can search for Biceps and Banter. I'm sure that our channel will come up um, because no one else is stupid enough to call their YouTube channel that. So, you're good. I'm sure I've seen one that's very similar. Maybe um, biceps and booze, maybe or beer. I don't know. Something, something very like that, similar. Yeah, there is there is one that's very similar. Yeah, but it's not as good. So. Yeah, <laughs> not as bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, thanks for joining me, Dan, and I'll speak to you soon. Yes.